Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about things that matter at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum counselor and teacher, intuitive guide, author and podcaster, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This show is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ancient wisdom validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. My intention for this podcast is to be engaging, educational, empowering, and fun, but it may also surprise or even shock you as we venture into deep rabbit holes and out on a limb as far as we can. Each conversation is different. Each guest is unique. Each episode is a story with profound wisdom you may want to listen to more than once. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Today our quantum conversation takes a slightly different turn as we look at the intersection of science and spirituality in healthcare. I think most people would agree that good health is the most precious commodity we have in life, and that's for a good reason. As my guest on the previous episode reminded us, when you have good health, you have thousand wishes. When you don't, you have only one. My podcast topics don't usually include health, so when I do an episode specifically on health-related issues, that's again for a good reason. (laughs) I have a strong personal interest in health and nutrition and recognize their importance in our life, and so I will always jump at the opportunity to bring to you some important or groundbreaking information, especially those of the quantum kind, meaning sitting at the intersection of science and spirituality. One notable departure from the quantum realm so far is my interview with Dr. Alan Goldhammer, The Amazing Benefits of Water Fasting, which is purely based on science, and I did it as I believe that this knowledge is critically important to promote, and that podcast has been hugely popular with many downloads across the world. But today I want to talk about integrating science with intuition and psychic skills effectively using the sixth sense, in a modality known as medical intuition. Medical intuition is not a new concept per se, as it has been around since at least Edgar Cayce's famous channeled diagnosis and treatments for various ailments and illnesses of the mind and body he was receiving in trance from the spirit. However, the sleeping prophet was just a conduit for passing such information from the spirit, he did not see or diagnose an illness in the patient's body himself. To this day, mediumship readings, which is communication with the spirit or the souls of people who have passed on to the other side, often contains health advice for the inquirer, ranging from prompting them to go and see a specialist and run some tests, adopt a healthier lifestyle, to changing their diet and taking specific supplements for better health. There is also a different concept of intuitive health advice, which I would categorize as a psychic modality or clair, when a medical intuitive can see psychically the energy disruption in the patient's body and energy field, indicating a health issue, and also receive information about it from the quantum field, which then they can pass on to the client. Well, that's what I think. (laughs) But I could be wrong. So, to help me unravel the concept of medical intuition and its role in the contemporary and future healthcare, I have invited to my show an expert in this field. My special guest today is Wendy Coulter. Wendy is a certified medical intuitive, certified wellness coach, author, and founder CEO of the Practical Path Company. She is also president of National Organization for Medical Intuition. Her accredited certification program, Medical Intuitive Training, has been pivotal in helping wellness professionals develop and optimize their inherent intuition. 
When this trailblazing research on medical intuition is published in the peer-reviewed Journal of Integrative and Complementary Medicine. Wendy is also the author of the groundbreaking book Essentials of Medical Intuition, A Visionary Path to Wellness, which we will, of course, talk about. And now, Wendy joins me from LA. Hello, Wendy. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure and honor to have you on my show. Oh, thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you and to be on your show. So thank you for having me. I first heard you on Gaia Open Minds with Regina Meredith, and I immediately thought that I'd love to have you on my show as this topic you speak about and how you speak about and the issues surrounding it are very important, especially now with the mainstream healthcare system scrambling all over the world and becoming, I would suggest, increasingly inadequate in properly diagnosing and treating health issues. When our understanding of our true nature as spiritual beings and quantum energy vibrations grows, we need more refined and holistic approaches to healthcare that we did, say, 500 years ago. Before we dive into this vast topic and start unpacking it, could you please share with us a little from your personal book of Genesis? <laughs> How did you end up on the path of medical intuition? Are you a natural psychic or have you developed this skill? And do you have a medical background? What well, great questions. So that's a there's a long answer there. <laughs> uh, the first part of it is how did I get started with it? Like many people who identify as intuitives, I was very intuitive from a young age. And I was intuiting things all the time. <laughs> and in my in my life, luckily, uh, my parents didn't um, stop me from doing that. In other words, many psychic or intuitive children are, you know, shushed or hushed or told that, you know, they're lying or they're making things up. Uh, my parents, although they didn't understand intuition, they acknowledged my ability <laughs> and, and uh, you know, in their own way encouraged it as a creative pursuit, right? So when I became an energy healer later in life, I noticed that as I was doing my energy healing work, uh, some people would come to my uh, office for an energy healing, and some people would really have a great release, and they'd come back later, and they'd have that same issue, whatever was going on. So I wanted to know what could keep an energy, uh, an energetic imbalance, you could say, or a physical imbalance stuck in someone's energy. And like many healers, I was getting a lot of hits, you know, intuitive hits of information. And those intuitive hits were wonderful, but I wondered if I could turn them into more of an assessment. And I had, you know, of course, heard about Edgar Cayce, uh, but I never really tried it myself. So uh, I thought, why don't I give this a try? And I found that in the process of not doing the energy healing, but just looking and seeing, because I had developed this ability to see in my mind's eye over the years. That was part of my early intuition as I could kind of see in the mind's eye. And I noticed that I could see right into somebody's body and I could also see their life history and where it had potentially come from, this imbalance. So with all that kind of data, um, I thought, you know, why don't I just sit down and just do a, an observational assessment before I even put my hands out and use my intuitive, you know, energy skills, right? And so I just, I, I started doing that and I saw that I could give the client so much information on no, not only the physical aspects of the imbalance, like looking right into the anatomy, looking right into the physiology. I could also give them a lot of data on uh, life experience, how this thing came to be, what belief systems were at the root of it, what uh, circumstances of life created an imbalance from an early age even that um, you know could have manifested in something later. And that information I found, Anna, was so powerful for my clients that they were, they were, when I started doing my energy work afterwards, you know, um, they were releasing things that were, you know, stuck for decades. And so it enhanced their experience of healing from the get go. And through that time, 
And I had taken, you know, psychic development courses, and I had actually taught things along those lines as well. I'd taken energy medicine courses. I'd, you know, been involved in spirituality for a long time. But this was something new that I was trying because I hadn't been taught how to do this. And um, and I found it worked. And of course, then I read, of course, the work of Carolyn Mace. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, this is very similar. This is kind of what I'm doing. It's an observational assessment rather than an energy healing. And I found that that doctors were calling me because, of course, my clients were out there talking to their doctors going, oh, my goodness, this intuitive did all this stuff and you know, told me all this stuff rather. And so they were calling me under the radar, <laughs> you know, very surreptitiously. Uh, you know, I heard about you. Can you look at one of my patients? I'm wow. not sure. So it became this kind of <laughs> secret society of, you know, and that's very typical okay. of medical intuitives. You know, we do our work, the word gets around. Next thing we know, doctors are calling us and uh, when I realized all of this a little bit later, of course, I thought, you know, if I could teach these doctors and these healthcare folks, you know, acupuncturists and other, you know, chiropractors and people who are working directly with patients and nurses, if I could teach them how to do this, you could, you know, if we could bring in medical intuitives into the healthcare field, how would that change medicine? How would it change the patient experience? And that's when I got very excited and about, um, 2009, I began my company and started teaching this skill set to healthcare providers. So that's the long, that's kind of the long story. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. So what is medical intuition? Is it a psychic modality? And where is this information coming from? Okay, great, great question. Um, you could say it is a psychic modality here. But I can tell you that if you were use the word psychic or clairvoyant or any of the woo-woo words, you'll clear a room of doctors in like five seconds flat <laughs> <laughs> because they don't want to hear that, right? And I do a lot of speaking at healthcare conferences, so I have to be very careful about <laughs> how I frame this. Um, but uh, where does the information, what, what is medical intuition from my perspective is, um, again, very much like Carolyn Mace and Edgar Casey, how they did their work. It's an observational, intuitive evaluation or assessment of the physical body, the actually anatomy and physiology, and the biofield, which is the chakra system and the auric field. And the difference between a psychic reading of your of your aura and a medical intuitive reading of your physical body, biofield, and you know, all the all of it together is is the information, the the intent of the information, right? The intent of the information from a medical intuitive session is intended to help the client understand what their body is trying to tell them, right? So I'm going to have a dialogue on a with your liver or your kidney or your system, right? Whatever system we're looking at or all of the above and ask it direct questions of what is it that's imbalanced and what does it want to balance? Now that uh, just on the physical side, you know, that's, that can take up an entire session if you want, right? There's a lot of information. Every cell in our body, every organ, every system has its own consciousness, right? Its own perspective. And so one of the things that we go through life in these wonderful bodies, we don't often know how to create that dialogue, right? Um, if we did, there'd be a whole lot more health going on. <laughs> um <laughs> But most of the time, people don't. So what a medical intuitive does is I consider us kind of a middle man or middle woman or middle person between the person's physical body, their biofield, and their conscious awareness. So when we talk about where does this information come from, uh, again, it comes from the physical body and the biofield, but it also comes from what I call the higher self. 
which is our connection to universal source, we could say, to all that is, to the quantum field. Uh, Dr. Larry Dossey calls this non-local consciousness, which is a wonderful way to frame it. Uh, Deepak Chopra talks about it. There's a lot of ways to talk about this um, super conscious, you could say, that holds tons of information. And what medical intuitives and how I train people is to uh, gain that information on demand. Mm, absolutely. And by the way, as I understand the issue of consciousness and cell consciousness and communication through the quantum field is a quantum phenomenon, and it has been pretty much uh, proven and evident scientifically. So for all those who are still sitting on the fence in terms of the spiritual aspect of it, you know, the metaphysical aspect of it, at this day and age, we are talking about science. So this is no longer fantasy or science fiction. We are talking about science. And later on, we will actually, I would like to talk about more about, you know, the research behind your work and, and your cooperation with various researchers. But would you agree with me that this is pretty much scientifically proven? Oh, without question. And there's, there's decades you. of science on uh, Thank you. quantum field study and the metaphysics and the spirituality around it. You know, <laughs> hopefully we're heading into an age where this kind of skepticism, you know, yes. reduces a bit because there really is so much data already. Yes. Thank you for saying this. So could you tell us a little bit about the history of medical intuition and how it has made inroads into the professional medical field? Well, you know, when I wrote my book, Anna, I, I, I started looking into this to say, where, where, when did this begin? You know, in recorded history, we know that shamans and, you know, seers and, you know, med medicine women and men <laughs> uh, and healers have been around for, you know, the, the dawn of humans. Um, and certainly the Greeks knew about energy and they knew about all this stuff and they wrote about it. But what about medical intuition specifically, that ability to be able to discern in the body specifically imbalances and specific recommendations? Well, it turns out that in recorded history, it goes back to about the late 1700s into the early 1800s and the mid 1800s, actually, uh, about 70 years of recorded um uh, sessions that came from uh, this gentleman named Franz Mesmer, who was a German physician. And, and he's one of the early energy healers. If you look in the energy medicine uh, canon, you'll see that a lot of it goes back to his work from the late 1700s into the 1800s. Now, his work was very controversial, but there were a lot of physicians and scientists in, the, in Europe who wanted to try his practices uh, because they wanted alternative ways of healing or different ways of healing their patients. Now, what they found, some, what they found was when the patients were mesmerized, meaning they kind of went into a hypnotic state, that the patient themselves could self-diagnose and could recommend for themselves accurate treatments, <laughs> right? That's wild. Yeah. And this is actually in the recorded history, and there's some books out there about it, which are just fascinating. And, and then it became a craze, right? And all through the late, you know, mid to really the early to the mid 1800s into the late 1800s, there was this craze of mesmerism to, to, to get correct diagnoses. And you can imagine the medicine at the time was pretty sketchy, right? And people were wanting to know how to heal. So this is all in the history books. And when I read about it, I, of course, wrote about it in my book so people could find that information. And so it goes all the way back to then. Now, from about the late 1800s, there was a complete shift in medicine where empirical data was the only way to go. So they started looking at the body as me mechanistic, like a machine. So all of that great, uh, you know, energy-based, you know, quantum field-based info and, and practice was decided, you know, the, the, the medical establishment really decided to kick it to the curb. And so really for the next hundred years, <laughs> that was no longer there until Edgar Cayce came along and in 19, 1925. And then, you know, through the, through the forties and fifties and whatnot, he kind of brought it back to the public eye, but it was very much a part of healthcare from those early days. And it was even, even scientifically vetted uh, the, the Academy of Medicine, or what it was called in France, did all these tests on it, and they found that there was val validity to it. Wow. 
So anyway, it's a, it's a real interest area of interest for me because it wasn't just medical intuition. They didn't call it that at the time. It was also things like uh, naturopathy and um, osteopathy and homeopathy and all of these energy-based um, healthcare practices that are still with us, but still not really accepted, right? You know, by mainstream medicine. It's called alternative medicine. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they call it now. <laughs> yeah, in, instead of primary medicine. Yes, exactly. You asked me how it interacts today, and I'm happy to answer that. Um, the answer to that is slowly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been very blessed to speak at some of the really premier integrative health and wellness centers in the country. And um when I give these talks to the medical professionals, you know, the doctors, the nurses, and, and so on, they recognize intuition in their fields. They do. Um, and they want to know more about how this can intersect and interact. And it might just be where we are in history, right time, right place. Um, it might be that there's been enough interest in biofield practices up to this point, and there's been enough science that it's starting to be more and more, at least, if not accepted, at least the interest is there. <laughs> so my book is now, um, you know, at UCLA uh, Healthcare uh, Center for East West Medicine. It's at Johns Hopkins Bookstore. It's at the uh, Anxious Campus, a medical campus in, in Denver. And more and more people are interested, healthcare professionals are interested in how can this support mainstream or conventional healthcare? And when you understand what medical intuition can do, which is to get to the root of the issue, both physically, emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually, the value is, I mean, it's its still in its infancy, you know, what it can do for healthcare in general and in specific, right, for patients and for doctors. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I dare say that the point when researchers and doctors and medical practitioners start coming to you when interested in finding more information about it is when they start seeing results. Yes. And the results yes. speak always for themselves. So then you, you want to backtrack and, and mm -hmm. reverse engineer, okay, how did we get these results following this pathway, which we could not get using simply the conventional medicine? And yes, science, as it evolves and grows and gives us more information, is an important, if not critical, vehicle for combining those two approaches. For example, what used to be known as mesmerism and hypnosis, which was this very mysterious state, yeah. today <laughs> we know that this is simply going into the theta state. So this is about lowering your brain waves from beta to alpha to theta, and be able to maintain that theta state, which is very elusive, because naturally we go through this uh, theta state twice just before going to sleep and, and we are waking up. When someone is able to maintain that theta state, that's where magic begins. Mm, I, I actually <laughs> teach uh, theta meditation nice. and teach people how to go into this state, how to achieve it, and then maintain it because this opens all the doors. Yes, ma'am. It certainly does. So the point is, hundreds of years ago, that was a mysterious hypnotic state that some people were afraid of. Today, we know exactly what it is. It mm -hmm. opens the door to our consciousness. It opens the door to communicating with other dimensions. It's still mystical. We still don't know much about it. And there is a growing number of scientists and researchers working on this and studying this phenomenon based on the outcomes and the results that people get. So it is very exciting. And I'm very pleased to hear that you include this in your courses and programs, which we'll talk a bit more about. Mm, very nice. I like that. Well, in my program, I teach a method of, um, it's a kind of a meditation method that gets us to that. I'm not, I haven't ever tested to see if it is theta, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. Because what we're doing is we're accessing these, um, you know, we could call it superconscious or whatever you want to call it, quantum field state so that we can actually do the observation that we need to do to get the information. Yeah, very good.
So, Wendy, what's the difference between medical intuition, remote viewing, and energy healing? And can anyone learn these modalities, or do you need to have certain predispositions or psychic gene? Wow, I like that. The psychic gene. No one's ever said that to me before. I think that's a great way to say it. Well, I'll say that everybody has the ability. Everybody. And because intuition is part of our human nature, it's it's hardwired. Yeah. Uh, we just don't have a society that understands that or or values it, right? The way that a professional, like, you know, intuitive like me would. Um, but everybody has it. And so one of the misconceptions about intuition is that you have to have this special gene. <laughs> Or you have to have be born with some gift. And I don't believe that for one moment. I've taught, listen, at one point I taught, I had my husband go through my program and my husband is a wonderful, pragmatic gentleman uh, from Australia, (laughs) pragmatic Aussie. And, you know, he's like, well, honey, I don't have a psychic bone in my body. (laughs) And I'm like, well, I can teach you how to do this, right? You're going to be my guinea pig. He is one of the best medical intuitives I've ever taught uh, because he didn't have any, you know, any ideas about it. He just came in and said, sure, I'll do it. And so, (laughs) (laughs) so I know for a fact that, you know, even a skeptic can learn how to do this. And um, the difference between such a good question, and thank you. The difference between energy healing and medical intuition is what I mentioned earlier in my own story. The job of an energy healer is to remove blockages, just like the job of a doctor is to prescribe, right? Mm -hmm. Or the job of a an acupuncturist is to use needles or whatever and herbs. It's it's a job to do. And the and the body is prepared for that. The body, you know, responds or doesn't respond or whatever. Medical intuition is not that. Um, in fact, that is why I teach so many healthcare professionals across the spectrum of healthcare. Medical intuition is a foundational skill that supports any kind of healing practice and from energy healing to surgery, you know, it's, it's anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it even supports health coaching and mental health care and you name it. Because I think of it as like where you begin, right? You start there. You start by getting the lay of the land with the physical body, the physiology, how the cells are responding on and on, uh, what they want, where did it come from? Why is it here? Why did it manifest? There's so many questions you can ask, right? And all of that data is inform it's informing the client in a conscious way. And that conscious awareness shifts it it performs miracles in many mm. cases, right? And I don't mean to say that medical intuition performs miracles. I mean to say that how we assimilate that information can shift the balance powerfully in terms of our own experience of health. Right. So can we say that medical intuition is not medical intervention in a sense? Correct. It is not it is not an intervention. So you're you're really right on on it. It's a misconception out there. Uh, medical intuition is not energy healing for this reason, just like it's not any kind of healing. Um, and uh, it, it is not interventional in that way. So I say to the doctors when I speak to them, this is not a treatment. This is not an intervention. This is not a healing modality. It's none of those things. It is a foundational support system for you to and your your patient to understand visually and specifically in high detail, what's happening in the body, what's happening in the biofield, what's happening in the life history, what's happening on the spiritual level. And that information can inform things down the line powerfully. The doctors want to work with me because they want to know how to help their patients in usually in very challenging healthcare situations like uh, COVID, you know, has mm-hmm. a million different permutations. There's long COVID. There's so yeah. people want to know what is the body asking for because everyone's body is dealing with this slightly differently. Lyme disease, uh, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. When I first started my practice twenty something years ago, that was not even very very few people were talking about those things or even understood it. Uh, SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Again, I was seeing this, you know, 15, 17, 20 years ago, there was no language for it in the public awareness, right? And I'm saying, well, there's a whole lot of bacteria in there. What is the, what is the, what does the intestine want, right? And so these are the kinds of things that my clients then take to their doctors. And that's what's so fun about it, right? So when I when I do a session and I tell my client, okay, you might want to ask your doctor about this, or this is what I see here visually, I can describe it to you. Now go describe it to your doctor. 
and doctors love it. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. So does it involve an element of remote viewing? Ah, uh, yes. You know, you could say that because technically I would say, yeah, it's a remote viewing kind of skill. However, uh, it is a little different than remote viewing in that uh, remote viewing was created for a very specific purpose. From everything I've read about remote viewing, there are some people who are you know, very detailed about it and some people who are more general about it. This is an incredibly detailed process. Uh, so, you know, to be totally honest, Anna, I don't have a background in remote viewing. Uh, I have a background in, you know, psychic training and medical intuition and, and you know, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. But I think there are parallels for sure. Yeah. Okay. But I think there are a lot of remote viewers who wouldn't call themselves medical intuitives. And I think there are a lot of medical intuitives who wouldn't call themselves specifically remote viewers, you know? Yes. And I think at the end of the day, this is just semantics because remote viewing, and I had a, I, I did an interview with uh, Stefan Schwartz, on, who is an expert in, in this field. Remote viewing is effectively and essentially a psychic skill of clairvoyance. It is, yeah. In a nutshell. So it is called differently. It has a different label because um, there is different process or an assigned process for this. And again, the intention was to uh, disassociate it from the psychic, quote unquote, <laughs> to make it more <laughs> as a scientific approach. But at the end of the day, Stefan yeah. said it is a psychic phenomenon of clairvoyance. He's, he's correct. Where you connect to yeah. a non-local consciousness where you can see into the past, present and future. So it's just a label, but effectively what it is, it is the same thing of being able to go with your consciousness outside of your five physical senses yes. and your 3D reality and then access information, whatever you want to access and, and wherever it is. And just very quickly, a personal comment on <laughs> You mentioned a chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. To me, this is just a label which says, we don't know what it is. <laughs> oh, there's so much of that in medicine, which the doctors yeah. will be very... We don't know what it is. Be so we very... call it that. Yes, exactly. And <laughs> the doctors will tell you that this is a general term because <laughs> we don't know. And so, yeah. um, you know, this is where medical intuition really can fill the bill because not only yes. it's not that we have a name for things. In fact, I want to make a finer point on this is as a medical intuitive who is not a medical professional and I have no license in medicine, I do not diagnose. I can't, that would be practicing medicine. But what I can do is I can describe and that description can inform the doctor's diagnosis. And that's how medical intuitives and doctors work together really well and have traditionally in the past, um, is the doctor will take that information, be able to use it to create a, you know, a, whatever they need to do. So um, I want to also point out that the skill set that I teach is very pointedly and specifically clairvoyance uh, because there's a reason for that. Thank you. Yeah, there's a reason yes. for that. Number one, I want to see what's going on. <laughs> so I have to know my anatomy, right? I have to know what a healthy liver looks like. I have to know what the systems are. There's the 11 systems of the body and there's more now. I have to know a little bit about it. I don't have to know everything about it enough so that I know I can look at it like, well, there's a map and this goes to this and this is connected to that. What I can also do, which is outside of the way Western medicine works, is the other part of the job is to ask to see the connections between one issue and anything else going on. So the problem we have in medicine, and I mean from integrative to conventional, um, is that everybody looks through one lens, right? They're trained in their viewpoint. And so when you go see even a, 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 an acupuncturist, you know, or, well, that's not the best example because they have a broader system. But if you go see a GI doctor, a gastroenterologist, that's the lens they're going to look for. They're the specialist. So they're going to look at that. Now, they're not going to look at the other systems of the body necessarily or anything else other than their training. And that's what you want, that we go to see a specialist for their specialty. But medical intuitives uh, are not, we're not specialists per se. What we do is we look at the primary issue and what's the secondary tertiary, what, what else is going on in the body that might relate to this or the genesis of this or the healing of this, right? 
And so that's why when science comes up with the gut-brain connection, I have to laugh and cheer because, yeah, we've been looking at the gut-brain connection for decades, right? We've been looking at the early life trauma for later life health issues, which is now called adverse childhood experiences, lots of science about it. Again, I, I have to say, well, medical intuitives have been seeing this for, for centuries, you could say, for decades. We know, we see it. So it's lovely when science catches up, but we would like science to you know, work with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, oh, beautifully said. And by the way, when I talk or think about integrative medicine, to me personally, this should include not just so-called alternative therapies, but also all specializations in conventional specialist areas. For example, when you go to see an eye doctor, cardiologist, and after seeing four or five different specialists who will give you their opinion about the issue that you are having, what often transpires is that the issue combines particular imbalances in all those parts of your body. Mm -hmm, and yeah. so to me, a truly integrative medicine is about combining the knowledge and information gained through those very special, very, very focused lenses, as you beautifully said, into a holistic approach, a holistic assessment of the patient, which you, a medical intuitive, mm -hmm. take it even further beyond the physical body, beyond the information we receive from the five physical senses. So you go into other frequencies, other dimensions, other mm -hmm. sources of information. You go into mm -hmm. the energy field. So to me, this is a truly integrative medicine, a holistic approach which goes beyond conventional science and includes our spiritual self, which is an integral part, hence integrative medicine. Yeah, well, yes, 100% yes, and perfectly stated, Anna. And I really appreciate your understanding of this, um, because this is what I lecture about, exactly that. <laughs> Say, mm. what, what is actually, what is integrative medicine? It doesn't mean that you bring in, you know, your, your, your nutritionist and all that. That's great. That's important. But it's, it's, we're right, we're at the very beginning, in my opinion, um, being part of the integrative world. I, I'm one of the guest educators at the Academy for, Inter for Integrative Health and Medicine, the AIHM, which is a wonderful organization here in the, in the States that seeks to raise awareness and teach and, you know, bring that to the conventional medicine world. They're wonderful folks. And I was very honored to be on their, uh, kind of their guest, guest instructor because they understand that what we're needing is that holistic, you know, top to bottom view, by, not just body, but mind, spirits, uh, you know, and mental, physical, emotional, spiritual. And all of that is contained if, in a medical intuitive session, all, every bit of that. So yeah, I'm right there with you. So what do you think are, based on your experience and, and your, your speaking events and your collaboration with various researchers and medical institutions, what are the key resistance points and pressure points? What are those doctors and scientists and researchers afraid of? Is it just they are afraid of something they don't understand, which is a you know, typical, a normal reaction, or is there something more to it? Like, well, one day our profession will become obsolete. I'll, I'll have no job. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, that's such a good question. Um, I can I can tell you the way you know. Again, I came into this whole world of medical intuition from not having any background in in the healthcare fields, mm -hmm. uh, other than energy medicine, which of course is very sidelined, but. Um, what I noticed when I started approaching uh, the, the medical professionals is two things. I mentioned this earlier. Number one, they kind of understood the whole notion of intuition because a doctor that follows their gut hunches, their gut feelings or hunches, 
uh, that pan out. And nurses are brilliant at this. Nurses, you know, there's 36 years of nursing um, research that's published on how nurses use intuition. They've been at the forefront of this for over 30 years. So I started by talking to the nurses and saying, tell me what you Good. know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> about this, because you guys are out there going, I yeah. think there's something wrong with that patient, yeah. but there's nothing clinically showing up. And over and over again, yeah. they've been proven right. And so they want to they want to know. So they were very open to this right off the bat. And what they say is um, that it's all about empirical data because that's that mechanistic empirical viewpoint that started in the late 1800s and is still with us. And so if it's, if you can't prove it somehow scientifically with a scientific method, which I believe in, it's a wonderful thing, then it doesn't exist. Right. So, and in and in and around that there's you know, nurses in the ER going, you know, here, here, do this, do that. And doctors using their intuition left right, and right. But, but, keeping it quiet from their colleagues because they don't want to be labeled a kook, right? So empirical data is critical. And when I wrote the book, I had already completed my research study that was published in a, you know, a very uh, revered medical journal. And that research came out of the fact that I had looked into the research on medical intuition and there was very little as opposed to say acupuncture, which is also an energy modality, it's an energy modality, and there's tons of research on it, uh, or other things where there's lots of research and it's more accepted now. So I understand the left brain kind of fear factor of the superstition that you know is inherent in human nature uh, for these things like psychic phenomenon, but the when it comes to very practical applications of it, then the research has to be there. So what I did, again, no academic background in this at all, I said to uh, some of my friends who are also mm-hmm. you know, colleagues of mine who were at University of, of um, Sa- California, San Diego, I said, I want to do a study because there's not enough studies. There was only like five studies and they were inconclusive and they were too small <laughs> and they were, you know, all kinds of problems with them. And I said, you know, people need to know uh-huh. what this is. So uh, put together kind of a pilot uh, exploratory study, which is what you do when you know you're just starting out. And we had five of my graduates because I knew my graduates were nailing it. You know, they have to turn in case reports, and there's a lot of uh, detail about the work that they do in my program. And so they were nailing it, nailing it, as I knew they would. And um, I said, "Well, let's test them. Let's see." So we had five of our graduates. We had 67 people from the community who wanted to participate. Some of these people were patients at UCSD Medical Center. And we did um, blinded sessions, meaning the medical intuitives had their eyes closed. We did no health intake. We had no access to medical records. And they just did their sessions. Uh, and then we had the, the the participants fill out a survey, you know, an, an anonymous survey about the accuracy of our medical intuitives. And we found that they uh, rated the medical intuitives as 94% accurate wow. in the location and evaluation of their primary health issue. Again, no discussion, no intake, none of that. Uh, they found uh, 98% accuracy in their looking at life experience that may have led to that health issue. I mentioned sort of the whole life story. So 98% accuracy there. We also had a 94% accuracy rate in what they felt was consistent with any medical diagnosis they might have had from their doctors, right? So the medical intuitive described it in such a way that they felt it was consistent with their diagno- their, un- their known Extremely diagnosis. High. That Extremely right there, that high. particular piece of data blew the... Re- wow. Doctors don't even, they say, we're lucky if we get 80%. You know? So we took that data and there was a whole lot more in there. And I wrote all about it in the book, but we we took it to um, the Journal of Integrative and Complementary Medicine. We wrote up a, a research report, and they published it because it was the first. Uh, not only was it, uh, you know, these numbers were pretty astounding. Frankly, we were astounded by them. We also found that it was the first published research in over twenty years on this subject, on this field. And that's, to me, that's a shame. There should have been study after study after study because anecdotally, medical intuitives, um, you know, the ones that have been doing, working in the field for a long time, they know their accuracy rates. They know that they're 
they are nailing it for their clients, so to speak. They're getting it right. And it's all been under the radar. It's all been anecdotal. And we need more research. So uh, you had wonderful Holane Wabe from Ion. Yes, <laughs> Michelle. I know you did. Yes. And uh, she and I have been collaborating on another research study. So hopefully we'll be able oh, to good. forward this. Uh, idea of how medical intuition can support healthcare. Yes, that that would be that would be really great. And just a couple of points. One argument for conventional medical doctors to respect more intuition as a phenomenon is when we talk about parents' intuition when it comes to their children. It just happened that recently, in, in the past few months, we had in Australia several cases where a little child got very sick. Parents yeah. took them to the emergency yeah. at the hospital, and the doctor said, oh, there is nothing wrong, really serious. They gave them basic medication and sent the child home, and the child died. Oh. Wow. And the parents were frantic. They were said, no, 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 there's, there's something really serious. There's something wrong. You need to run all the tests. You need to keep your... Oh, no, no. And in many of those cases, it was meningitis which, as you know, develops very quickly and, and, will, and can kill you within a few hours if left untreated. And so my point here is that parents, you know, mothers who knew there was something very wrong with the child, the child was really, really sick, insisted on starting some sort of treatment. And the doctors were saying, no, there's nothing really serious, just the flu or whatever. And the child died. That's tragic. And we had several such cases. So again, I think th this should, amongst many other things, this should serve as a really a wake-up call for conventional medicine doctors to actually pay attention, oh, yeah. at least to what the parents are saying in relation to their children, because mothers, as we know, especially are very closely linked energetically yeah. with the child. And the mother will know if there is something really wrong happening. So to dismiss it, and then after the child has died, saying, oh, whoops, very sorry, you know, we should have run the test and we should have given antibiotic, given as a precaution. Or, well, it's too late. The child has died. Yeah. So let me, let me speak to that. Please. Because that is a dramatic, absolutely dramatic and an awful, tragic experience. And it's not uncommon in the States as well. What's also not uncommon is people being told by their doctors there's nothing wrong when they know there is something wrong. Because Western medicine either is not paying attention or they don't have the, the mechanism to look at that even. So I'm going to say this a couple of ways. Number one, um, there, there are medical intuitives in the ER. To me, that is critical, absolutely critical. We have to have that. Yes. In, there is one example of this that I'm aware of in, in UC San Diego. Uh, one of the doctors, an ER doctor, brought in a medical intuitive to work with her and shadow her as she saw patients. Really? And this wow. went on for uh, 12 years. I'm not sure if that's still happening. And the, yeah, the medical intuitive would stand by her side and tell her what she saw in the moment with this patient. And they, there's a wonderful video on YouTube about it where they're talking about saving lives. They saved lives in the ER because the medical intuitive said, pay attention to this, look at that, watch for this, right? And that is a perfect use for medical intuition. In the ICU, another place, in just in clinical health, in the book, I wrote about a wonderful doctor in New York. She's an integrative medicine doctor. She's very much an, an interested in medical intuition, and she works directly with a medical intuitive in her practice. She brings him in, the two of them sit together with the patient, and they bounce ideas off each other. The medical intuitive is doing his job, and she's doing her job, and the patient's involved, you know, and they come up with a treatment plan that the doctor can diagnose and prescribe for that the medical intuitive has been supporting the entire time. Because one of the things we can do is look to see how is the body responding to something or the idea of something, right? So again, when I said earlier, it's kind of in its infancy, I mean that because why wouldn't any doctor want to have a medical intuitive right there with them that they can check things with? They've been doing it under the radar for decades. Why wouldn't we want it right there, right? Not being a medical practitioner, I think I can answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> the issue is either 
the ego, the doctor's <laughs> ego. And I mean, seriously, yeah. I know better. I don't no, need I a you know, psychic to tell me what to do. Or more broadly speaking about resistance right. to uh, incorporating medical intuition into the, the normal conventional practice is fear that, well, if we allow this to grow, it will take over medicine. So we won't have a job. We won't be needed. If all information can be provided by a medical intuitive, including, you know, what needs to be uh, needs to be treated and, and potentially even how. Yeah. So the doctor will be needed basically to write a prescription or a treatment or organize a surgery. And that will be the end of it. <laughs> well, why do you think I've taught doctors? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I yes. teach doctors. So, but so here's the thing. Medical intuitives are not, we're not here to replace empirical testing. We're not here to replace anybody. And um, if that is the case, and honestly, I haven't heard that from doctors when I've talked to them about fear of being replaced. Mostly they're interested in using medical intuition or learning it for themselves so they can use it for their patients so that they can help their patients get the help they need so they can heal. I mean, that's the that's the Hippocratic Oath, right? Uh, do no harm. And you know, their whole job is to heal. In my book, and I interviewed, I don't know, half a dozen doctors over this. I said, okay, how would you use this in your practice? Because I know as a medical intuitive how I can support you, but how would you use it? Mm -hmm. And from those interviews, I created a scenario in, in chapter 10 about the in medical intuitive physician mm -hmm. and the medical intuitive physician and how they would work with their patient, how they would bring the information forward, how that it would inform their decision-making processes and how in-depth they can go. And they loved the idea. Okay. I mean, loved it because it it's not meant to replace anything. It's meant to enhance, support, yeah. expand, get the big picture, get the finite, you know, the, the more um, refined picture, you know, from the cell to the life story. So it supports everything. It doesn't replace anything. And, and he, here's the other thing. What if that drug... And that surgery and that treatment and that process is what the body wants, right? What about that? There's a lot of bias in the alternative or whatever you want to call it these days, complementary healthcare areas, where they say, oh, no, 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 Western medicine is the worst thing. It is not. It saves lives. It does. It can also do the opposite. But when we have this dichotomy, this split in healthcare, yeah. that's yeah. the problem. That's that's where the the it, it, the scenario that you brought forward about the child, the mother knew she was intuitive enough to know something was wrong, and she trusted that. Yeah. What if there was an, a medical intuitive nurse who could say, "Okay, come over here. We, we nothing's showing up in all of our testing. It looks like the flu." Nurse, come on over. Nurse takes a medical intuitive look, sees that there's inflammation, maybe in the meninges or in the spinal cord, and says, "I see something here. Let's look at that." Wouldn't that be phenomenal? That child would have survived. Yeah. Modern medicine is miraculous. You think about 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we didn't have the kind of treatments we have now. They save lives. And intuitive medicine is also miraculous. Energy medicine, biofield practices, also miraculous. Eastern practices, acupuncture and Ayurveda, miraculous. And naturopathic medicine, you know, is phenomenal. And people don't know because it's not in the public awareness what opportunities they have. And also, people don't know what might work and what might not. And, you know, you can go to five or 10 or 200 different kinds of practitioners doing 200 kinds of different things and still not get the, you know, the, the relief you're looking for. And so people get very jaded. Um, what I do as a medical intuitive as well, and what I teach is how to prioritize, what does the body want? Does it want this kind of thing? Does it want that kind of thing? What is it asking for? And the things I learn, Anna, just by asking that question are you know, foreverly, they, they will forever fascinate me because I learn about, because the body tells me, the energy tells me, the quantum field that brings us in about things I would have no knowledge of. Could you give us a couple of case studies, a couple of examples that, that stand out? Anonymous, obviously. <laughs> sure, sure. 
Yeah, no, I've got tons of them. Um, one of the fun ones in regards to that um, was, a, I'll just give you a really short one and I'll give you a longer one. Um, in regards to an issue that I had no knowledge about, um, there was a gentleman, I wrote about him in the book, who uh, was concerned about a, um, a surgery, a hernia surgery, because he didn't, he was worried about the mesh uh, issue, because hernia mesh can be rejected by the body. And, and there's a lot of lawsuits. And it's, you know, kind of a, a not a, it's not, it, it's, it can be unsafe for patients. Um, and so he was really worried about that. And so I'm looking at his issue, you know, clairvoyantly, I'm seeing where the, you know, the issue is. And the information that came through was fascinating to me. I was looking at it and I said, you know, uh, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that there is um, some new science about how the, the mesh, this is many years ago, how the mesh can be coated with the patient's stem cells and that keeps it from being rejected and lowers inflammation. I said, I don't, I've never heard of this. I'm just looking at it. I'm seeing your body showing me, your energy showing me that this is a possibility. Maybe you can talk to your doctor about this. There's a study, and it was even showing me there was a study done somewhere in some foreign country. And I'm like, this is probably worth looking into. And he said, oh, that's fascinating. After the call, after the session, I immediately got online, right? I'm like, mesh, mm -hmm. you know, hernia <laughs> mesh and stem cells. What the heck? Turns out there was a study done the month before uh, the, really the month prior in China, where they did a successful operation where they coded, they practiced, they just said, let's just try this. They coded the mesh with stem cells and it did exactly what I saw. Now that's about tapping into that, you know, quantum field. Yeah, yeah. And and it gave the gentleman some ammunition, so to, so to speak, some information to take to his doctor to say, is this possible? Now, it wasn't possible at the time because it hadn't hit the US yet. But if you look online now and you do a Google search on stem cells and mesh, you'll see it. <laughs> there it is. So that's one really small okay. example of that um, about how medical intuition mm. people think, well, do I need a medical background? Do I need to know all about medicine? The answer is you'll never know everything. And even if you have that, the doctors that I teach really get this, they know. Uh, that you, you can only know what you know, and then you tap into the, the quantum field, so to speak, and there's tons of information. So I'll give you I'll give you another example of of the the idea of the life history and how it informs the the physical and emotional, mental, spiritual experience. Uh, this was one um, an example that I actually talk about a good deal because it's a really good example of this. And this was a woman who had a very persistent case of tendonitis, you know, inflammation in her tendons and her wrist. And tendonitis isn't life threatening, you know, it's no big major deal. Yeah. But she had tried everything; it had been gone on for about a month. Nothing worked, uh, and she wanted to know if I could look at it. So I looked at it with that visual uh, looking into the body. I started there and I saw the inflamed tendons. It was pretty obvious. There was a lot of pain and inflammation. And underneath the tendons, I saw a, a healed um, fracture, like a wrist fracture. And that's what I was seeing physically. Now, there were other things going on in the body that were related to it, like, you know, kind of gut imbalance and sleep was not, you know, being, sleep was being impaired because of the pain. Um, but really, it was all about that wrist. So I started asking, as I do, okay, wrist, what do you want me to look at? And it started showing me life history. Now, life history is like watching a movie of someone's life, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's really interesting. And what it showed me was that uh, she was at about 20, at, at about age 20, this was about 20 years, she was about 40 years old. So it was about 20 years ago for her. Uh, at age 20, she was playing tennis with her boyfriend. I was watching this little movie and she swung her racket mm -hmm. and she tripped and fell. And that's where that broken wrist came from. She broke her wrist. The next scene was her in the ER with her boyfriend, getting her wrist work, you know, taped up or whatever. And her boyfriend broke up with her in the hospital room, right there. Wow! Right, exactly. So her wrist was showing her wrist was showing me that not only had it retained or held on to this fracture pain, the pain of the physical break, but also the emotional pain <laughs> was embedded in there, mm -hmm, right there. Now, what was really was interesting is. That she had a memory. She knew she remembered that time. And she said to me out loud, she said, oh my gosh, I remember that. And then she said, oh, 
my partner broke up with me about a month ago, right before the tendonitis showed up. So what her wrist was showing us was that there was a, a all of that stored emotion and pain, physical and emotional pain, flared up in this recent breakup. Now, here's what's really fascinating too, is that her wrist had another life event to show me. And it showed me her at about age five years old. Uh, she was in a dark closet and she was holding her wrist up for protection right in front of her face, same wrist. And there was a cane striking her right there on that wrist, very dramatic. And uh, she stopped me and she said, oh my gosh, she said, and I could have gone forward and seen more, but she said, my mother was mentally ill. She used to beat me with her cane and lock me in a closet. That was her light. That was when she was very young. And so her wrist was again, indicating honestly on a, a lifetime of trauma and, and pain, physical and emotional pain right there in that wrist. And so there was, that was a wonderful experience for her to see the correlation because she had memories. Many people don't remember things. She remembered these things. And when you think about the logic, and we love using our left brain logic, right? Well, yes, I was abused as a child. And yes, my wrist was impacted. And yes, I had this experience at 20. But what about now? You don't really see a logical line unless you look at it from this perspective. And that is the body's perspective, right? the body's conscious awareness. Oh, I'm loving it. Yeah. Now, next piece of this is I asked the body, what does it want to heal? And there were some things about, I mentioned gut health and sleep and you know pain mitigation and things like that. But really uh, for her, it was about the emotional experience through the years and where it was being stored in that wrist in her body. That was one place for her to store that. And her higher self, uh, her higher self, her energy, her quantum, quantum field, all that really indicated that this was an emotional, um, something to release emotional. Trauma. And that was like the trauma. Yeah, yeah. The, the trauma. Yeah. And so that information was enough for her. And there were some recommendations there, but she called me two days later and she said, it's gone. The pain is gone. And I said, like, you've got to be kidding me. Well, that's amazing. Tell me what happened. And she said, making those emotional connections from my life history allowed me to start to release the pain of the breakup, of her recent breakup. And she felt like she could process those emotions that she'd been holding, you know, not only emotionally, but in her wrist, literally. Yeah. And that's wonderful when that happens. Um, and so that's a good example of what the emotional, mental, spiritual part of the physical, you know, um, anatomy's presentation or manifestation. That's that whole train of, of information that can come forward. Oh, this is so beautiful and amazing. Thank you for sharing. And I, and I think you, you've picked just the right example, just the right case study to illustrate what this is all about. So thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Oh, I'm absolutely loving it. Now, I've got another interesting question. Can you or any medical intuitive see an energetic imbalance in the person's aura, which has not yet manifested physically, and it could manifest or not. Now, I understand that such negative energies can be seen in the aura weeks, months, sometimes even years before the illness develops. Now, if you can see this, do you warn the client about it and suggest perhaps some preventative action which they might take to ensure that this imbalance will not manifest in their body and how? Things like changing their lifestyle or diet, stop smoking or drinking, start meditating, etc. So can you see into the future, if you like, of what the body already contains energetically? Um, yes. And uh, let me tell you how I work with that. Uh, and this is actually one of the reasons why medical intuition is so challenging to study. Because medical intuitives, and myself included, might see something that hasn't manifested yet. Uh, we might see something that manifested in the past, but the imprint of it is still there and active in the client's energy. Now, that's interesting when you think about it. 
And we may see something that uh, may never manifest, but it is present when we look, right? So again, you know, when we talked about talk about studying this, it's like, you know, how empirical are we talking here? <laughs> because what if we see something that is in its, you know, energetic gestation phase, so to speak, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So the answer to that is twofold. When I'm working with clients, I always tell them what I see. And uh, the, the, the information always comes with recommendations. We never leave people high and dry. There's always something that the body is asking for, either as preventative or as if, you know, if there's a current issue or an acute issue or a, a chronic issue. Uh, there's always information on how to help balance so the body can balance, right? With, with, and it can be dietary, it can be anything. Now, again, I don't prescribe. So what I'm going to do is if there's, you know, what looks like possible drug or, you know, supplement opportunities there, I'll refer them to a good naturopathic doctor or, you know, talk to their doctor or whatever it is. So um, there's always a way to help people find the help they need. And that's how I see medical intuition is my job is to create a path for my client so that they can get the help that they they, they want and their body wants and their mind and spirit want. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I deal with it. I don't like the idea of fortune telling. To me, that is dangerous for medical intuitive. I think it's dangerous for psychics too, to believe it or not, even though the world of psychic is full of fortune telling. Um, because here's the reason why, Anna. Everybody, no matter what is going on for them in life, no matter where things are, we have this wonderful thing called free will. And that means with our own free will, we have the opportunity to manifest what we want right? To manifest the, the experience of life that we're hoping for, that we're looking for, that we're wanting. And that's a really potent concept, right? It comes from the law of attraction. It comes from a lot of things that we've heard in the past, you know, 20, 30 years, but it's real. It means that, you know, there are a lot of doctors now or alternative practitioners even or integrative that say, say out loud, I want to be well. Just say it out loud. <laughs> That's a kind of a free will stance where you say, I want to be well. You speak to the listening of the body, right? You speak to the cells of the body. Uh, Louise Hay's work is based on all of this, affirmations. So you can call it woo-woo or non-effectual or whatever, but here's the thing. Your body's always listening, right? Your, your psyche, your spirit is always listening. And how we feed ourselves spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically, it all adds up. So we, we have to remember that we're in the driver's seat. And when we, you go through the mill of conventional health care, you can feel very powerless, right? Yes. So yeah. what a good medical intuitive should do, whether or not they do it or not, I can't say. My students do. <laughs> My graduates do. And that is that we want to empower the client so that they understand their free will, where they are with it, so that they can take charge. Mm, absolutely. Uh, I'd like to share with you that, well, I'm quite intuitive, but when it comes to my healthcare, my own healthcare, I am particularly discerning. And for example, even when I go and see my regular doctor, to her chagrin, I never take her advice as granted and just follow it. For example, when she gives me some prescription for medication, I will not take it until I research it myself online. And there were instances where I found there was a particular drug that she wanted me to take. I found that there was a particularly nasty potential side effect. And I said, nope, I'm not taking it. Good for you. Oh, well, but you know, it's very, I said, nope. Doesn't matter. It can happen. I'm not taking it. So, <laughs> so I actually, I always take charge, if you like, in a sense that, yes, I'll obviously ask for her professional opinion and, and her, uh, you know, diagnosis and treatment, but I will always vet it. Very good. If I don't feel intuitively that I need a particular test, I won't do it because it's just <laughs> a waste of time. Mind you, obviously, I realize that not everyone has this sort of attitude <laughs> or this level of discernment. But as an add-on to your point about being self-empowered in your healthcare, I would encourage people <laughs> to be more empowered even in your conversation with regular conventional doctors. Because 
they are humans too. They have different levels of training. They can make mistakes too. You know, there is a range of drugs that they can choose from for a particular condition. And my body will tell me which of those drugs I could take is better for me and which is not. And I quite freely share those views, my own personal opinions with my doctor, so you now which drives her crazy. So, <laughs> but she knows yeah. me well. Yeah, and but she knows me well, and and she knows that you know until I vet what she has prescribed to me, what she suggests, it won't happen. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I have another question. I heard you speak about energy hygiene, mm, yes. and which yeah. I believe is very important. So, could you please speak to energy hygiene at the practical level, so that people can understand what to do and why? Absolutely, I will. And I, can I can I address what you just talked about because it was so great? <laughs> sure. Yes. Yeah, I do. do the same thing. I'm the squeaky <laughs> wheel. I'm the pain in the butt to my doctors, and they know what I do. <laughs> they know I'm a medical intuitive. So most of them listen. Um, if you were my client in that circumstance, I would be doing what you kind of did. In other words, I'd be looking at that drug and I'd be putting it where it was supposed to do its job and I'd be observing what I observed and I'd give you that observation and you could take that to your doctor. And that's how I work with my clients when they say this or that. I can't diagnose or prescribe, but I can tell you if I put that there, is that going to work? Is that going to be effective or that? Would that might that yeah. be effective? And then go tell your doctor and see if they have an opinion about it and see if they can adjust it. Mm -hmm. I do that with myself. All, what you described, I do it with myself all the time. And as a medical intuitive, Mm -hmm. That's my prerogative. You know, we get to do that as intuitives. So yes, I love teaching people how to do that for themselves. <laughs> and it it what it does is it makes you feel less um helpless, right? It it actually empowers you. It empowers you. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. very important. And I love the doctors that are willing to listen <laughs> to that yeah. patient. Yes. So yes, yeah. and yeah, ab absolutely. Thank yeah. you. So Energy hygiene. Yeah, so let's talk about energy hygiene. Um, we think a lot about hygiene, especially with COVID. We wash our hands and we brush our teeth and we make sure that we have all that stuff, right? Um, energy hygiene is about keeping your energetic biofield, that's your, your auric field and your uh, chakra system, clean and balanced. And there's many ways to do it. The three main components that I teach for everyone to learn is starting with grounding. And that's a very common concept uh, nowadays, uh, particularly in the energy healing field. And that is making a connection between your physical body and the earth, right? And why do we do that? Well, we do it because our bodies are made of earth stuff. <laughs> you know? We're made of the same yeah. kind of cells that we find <laughs> out there in the natural world, you know, that are body yeah. cells and not tree cells, but the same idea. So we want to make a connection between our physical body and the earth, and it's really healing to do that. It's a very healing thing. And we do it by imagining that there's a connection. And how I like to teach this is you imagine the soles of your feet when you're sitting in a chair sort of flat on the ground, and you imagine roots growing into the ground, and you imagine yourself connecting with the earth. Very simple. Um, scientifically, there's a lot of wonderful data on this idea they call earthing right which is the same concept yeah. where you put your feet in the grass you know <laughs> or you energetically or electrically connect somehow to like you you do a, a grounding like an electrical grounding yeah and all of that shows scientifically has been shown to speed up healing to calm the nervous system to uh, you know um raise the efficacy of the immune system i mean there's so much research on it. So just by imagining that connection, that's connecting your biofield, essentially your auric field to the earth. A wonderful thing to do. Very simple. The next step I call uh, shielding. And shielding is really good, especially for highly intuitive people that are very, very sensitive. You know, they walk around kind of like a, a big sponge, you know, <laughs> sucking things <laughs> up. And that's that's clairsentience, you could say, or you know, that kind of thing, where people feel yeah. a lot. And um, that I suggest you create like a three-foot ring around your body above you and below you and fill it with a protective light. Uh, I like purple. Purple's a good light, but there's other colors as well. Any color really mm -hmm. will work. And what you're doing there is you're you're creating a buffer zone <laughs> between you and the world around you. And 
you can see through it, you can work with it, you can hug people with it, you can do anything you want. But the point is that you've set up an energetic space for yourself. So um, that's a wonderful skill to try and to practice. You can walk around with it. You know, it's just a great thing. The third thing is knowing how to release whatever's in your energy that you don't want to hold on to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, emotions, overthinking, you know, worries, concerns, things that are really weighing you down. And believe me, we live in a very, and you don't, we all know, we live in a very intense time on the planet right? Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is turn the news on at night and you're completely tense. (laughs) Yeah, You know, you're you're overloaded. And so a way to offload that overload is to imagine you can just like pull it out. Like if I have a feeling in my gut that's got me tense and nervous, I'm going to pretend I can reach right into my gut, you know, and pull that thing out and put it in a soap bubble. And I'm just going to keep filling up that soap bubble. And when that soap bubble is full, I'm going to imagine it, you know, a big gust of air sending it right up into the clouds and popping into golden sparkles. And that's a beautiful way to just take a few minutes to get rid of something. Now, the reason I put these energy hygiene skills together, besides in the main program, which we have even more of those, the reason I put those together for everyone is because the nurses that I was uh, approaching for this work, you know, the ones that said, oh, I really want to do your program, but I just need something that I can use right now (laughs) when I'm in the hospital and there's all this activity going on, or I'm in the ER, or I'm in the ICU. What can I do to keep myself focused and my energy so I'm not, I don't come home like this cat with its fur on end, you know? And I said, well, try this. And so they did. And they came back to me and they said, this is working perfectly. So they're in the Uh hospital, they're grounded, they're shielded, they're getting rid of stuff, they're doing their job, and they're having a great time. And it's shifted their experience and their self-care, really, their self-care. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad that I asked this question and that you gave me this answer (laughs) because you have just validated those three steps, which in fact I do for myself and I recommend to my clients as well because I know that they work. So thank you for your expert validation. And to all those skeptics out there who don't believe, how can I just move energy with my intuition? Well, with my intention rather. Well, your intention is your thought charged with an emotion and thought and emotion are electromagnetic current. So you can move energy with your thought and emotion. You don't see it. You may not feel it immediately, but that's actually what you can do. And I do hope that people listening to this podcast and obviously reading your book and doing your courses will start implementing it. And this is so simple. And it takes really for all those three steps, maybe a couple of minutes. So thank you so much. Those audios I have on the website, uh, audios for what I call energy essentials, which just like you, these are tools for my clients and for the world to practice because I think they're premier importance for people. So they are, there's, they're free. They're on the website. They're guided under the guided meditations tab. And they're called energy essentials for grounding, shielding, releasing. And I think I have one for connecting with your guidance as well. I'm not sure what else is on there. But these are basics that I think everybody should have. There are also exercises in the book and more besides. And there are going to be a lot more exercises in the upcoming self-study program that we're going to launch which is for everyone to learn how to have that connection and that conversation with your own body, right? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And obviously I will include the links in the show notes. So uh, to your book and to your website so that people can go there. Now, Wendy, before uh, we talk about your book, Essentials of Medical Intuition, A Visionary Path to Wellness. Before we get there, because I really want to to have a chat about it. I have one more question, which is a bit hairy question, and I love hairy questions. It's my 
my specialty. So I let's go out on the limb here and, and into a rabbit hole. Okay. Can you see, and if you do see that a particular medical or health condition for a particular patient is what their soul has chosen to go through, i.e. don't touch it, don't do anything about it, don't remove it, I want to experience it at the soul level. Can you see this type of information? And if you do, do you continue with what you do and helping clients to to address it? Or do you stop in respect of their soul's choice? That's an issue that keeps coming up in my work and in my own thinking and spiritual development. So I will illustrate with a particular case. And I had this conversation, it's on my other podcast, Embracing the Paranormal, as an ethical question. When I talked to Kedrick Olson about his work with energy, and I put to him the same question. He gave me a beautiful answer, which I won't repeat now because I want people to actually listen to the podcast. But the example that he gave me before answering my question, was about a single mother who had a very ill child. The child was disabled, both physically and mentally, so it was a very, very difficult situation for her to cope with. And Kedrick asked the spirit, what can I do to help this child? I really, because I can see the struggle, I I can feel the pain, I really would love to help this child. What can I do? And he said, Anna... I couldn't believe it. I received information directly from that child's soul, which said, thank you. I know what you're trying to do. I know you have good intentions, but please don't do anything. We had a contract. I had a contract with with the mother's soul, and the decision was to go through this experience. So please do not interfere. Don't do anything. And he said, well, that was so... It was such a powerful, such unusual experience for me, and I was startled, but that's that's the information I received intuitively. So I could have done a number of things, but I didn't because I honored the soul's choice to go through this experience. So I backed off and I didn't do anything. And then he gave me his response to my question. So I'll be very curious to hear from you. What is your take on this? First of all, I love this question. It, it is such a powerful question, Anna, and no one has ever asked me that before other than my students in class. So thank you. <laughs> um, here's my philosophy about that. Um, I'm working very closely with the client's physical body and the, the consciousness of the physical body as well as their higher self. Their higher self is their conduit, their connection to all that is. So my job is to have these conversations with the body and their higher self and say, what's, what's, what's going on here? What can I say? How do I say it? Um, this is the ethics of spiritual practice is what you're talking about. I'll frame this in the context of I have worked with people with terminal illness right? Whether they knew or had a conscious awareness that it was terminal or not, I could see it. So I have to be very careful and ethical in how I language and frame things to a client. So if I see something like what looks like abnormal cell structure, which might be cancer or some disease or something like that, how I language it to the client is critical because I'm not here to diagnose but I am here to help them get the help that their their bodies and their minds and spirits are asking for. You're asking a bigger question though. So the answer to that is the soul's perspective from, from my answer to that would be in that circumstance. Now I'm not, I wouldn't be healing the, an interventions an intervention. That's something different than what I do as we've, as we've discussed. So in the discussion of, let's say it's a child or an adult or whatever. Okay higher self. So this person is going through this and, you know, I'm asking for information. So what I would ask in that circumstance of the soul, so to speak, is I would say, what information can I give my client that will assist in the soul's contract that has been made here, right? What information will help the soul evolve based on the contract that I see is in play. That's a really profound kind of conversation. And that I've had that conversation with people who are facing terminal illness, right? Because that's always their question. 
Why did this manifest? What am I supposed to learn from it? What is the spiritual information here of this thing that's going on? Do I do I make changes? Do I not? Do I, you know, th- these are the questions that people who are facing that kind of thing have. And that's a phenomenal and very high level dialogue with the client's higher self to give them information that will help them in their quest, whatever their quest is, right? Thank you. This is, yeah. thank you, beautiful. Your answer to this question is along the lines of Kedrick's. It is essentially about getting to the highest level of us as spiritual beings having human experience, i.e. our soul. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for this. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. And and it's such a good question. I'm of the level at which we're talking about the soul's con- the soul's contract, so to speak, or the soul's reason, reason for manifesting as a human is always in play in a medical intuitive session, at least in mine, because I want to know from that perspective what the meaning of what's going on is all about. And the client wants to know it too, really whether they are aware that that's even a question to ask or not. You know, most people when they're having a health issue, like you said, um, you know, it's it's the main thing, it's taking up that space. But what about the spiritual aspects of it? Now, in every reading I do, in every session I do, there is always, and I'll bring it to back to my lexicon, there is always an original trauma, a core trauma that informs an entire string of life experience and or physical manifestation. Usually it's a physical manifestation of that. So people have asked me, can you just have a physical issue like a stub toe that doesn't come with all the rest of it? (laughs) My answer is, (laughs) No, you can't. (laughs) Because I have never only, in in this work that I've done over 20 years, I have never not seen an emotional, mental, spiritual combination that has led to whatever it is that's going on physically. And so from that perspective, in my world, Anna, that is the mind-body-spirit connection, right? Yes. It's your conscious awareness, your spiritual awareness, and your body's awareness, yes. right? And we don't we don't live life like that, right? The life isn't lived usually like that, and certainly medicine isn't isn't presented like that. And that's what medical intuition can really bring to the table. Absolutely, thank you. And if we bring into this mix the notion of free will, so for argument's sake, our soul in their planning and design of our of the blueprint for this particular incarnation may have decided, okay. At this point in time, let's manifest this particular illness or health issue, and this will be your free will to deal with it or not to deal with it or deal with it in different ways. So it would be an open-ended, if you like, health situation. It's up to you. Or it could be one of what I call those non-negotiables in our blueprint that now I want to go through this experience, period. You can't change it, so don't even bother. So, yes, beautiful. I'm loving this conversation. I am too. (laughs) You're asking such wonderful questions and really, really getting to the heart of the physical experience, the, 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 the spiritual being in a physical body experience. Like, what is this all about? I call it, uh, in my work, I call it the soul path um, trajectory. Really, it's like where we where we came in, what we chose to learn in this lifetime, the free will that we have, as you mentioned, to choose to learn it or or ignore it, <laughs> and then what goes on. And what's what's so wonderful about this work for me is, you know, looking at so many clients, looking at so much of this profound information. Um, it just humbles you, you know, it, 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 it makes you feel like this is such a precious, wonderful planet, you know, this precious, wonderful life. And we take so much of it for granted, because we're just here doing our thing. But when we sort of step back from it and look at it from the soul's pr- perspective, it's just pure joy, no matter what garbage we're dealing with. It is honestly pure joy. It's a privilege to have a body. It's a privilege to interact with, you know, other fellow humans. It's a privilege to be in nature. And and it's and it's beautiful. So if yes. we remember that more, I think we'd we'd have a little more gratitude going, you know.
Absolutely. Beautifully said. Thank you. Just to add quickly one point to this, that the higher the level of our perspective that we can take to look at our physical or, or emotional suffering, the easier it becomes to deal with it. The intensity, the perception of it goes down once we understand the overarching reason for it. Mm -hmm. So there's actually, I think yeah. there's some research, there's research around that too, mm -hmm. I believe. Yes, yes. And I think that, that IONS, people at IONS did some work on minimizing pain by disassociating, getting out of the, the physical into the mental and emotional. Oh, well, this is a completely new rabbit hole <laughs> <laughs> for another three-hour conversation. <laughs> so let's talk about your book, okay. your beautiful book, Essentials of Medical Intuition, A Visionary Path to Wellness. What is it about in a nutshell? Why is it unique and groundbreaking? And perhaps a couple of key messages and objectives, if you could just give us a bit of a snapshot of the book. Absolutely. So what it's about is the, the history, the practice, and the um, uses of medical intuition. And I wrote the book. There's wonderful books out there on medical intuition. Carolyn Mace's books, um, her early book, Anatomy of the Spirit, beautiful book on the subject. Uh, and there are other books too. But what I noticed in the books out there is that much of it was very personal you know, the, the practitioner's personal experience. And it, case studies are wonderful. There's a ton of case studies in the book, but I didn't want to write it from the point of view of my practice so much as I wanted to write it from the point of view of the field, because the field itself of medical intuition is not well understood. And it's also, you know, misunderstood like crazy. And, and I wanted to clear up confusion around it. So I wrote the book, um, for my audience, which are healthcare providers, because they don't know nothing about this, mm -hmm. right? Not, not many of them <laughs> Not <do>. yet. <laughs> and also, not yet. And also for the general public to understand, because the general public needs to know that there's this option and opportunity for them, right? So I wrote it from that perspective. Why is it unique? Uh, it's because it's not just the, the single practitioner's way of doing things. That's not what I wanted to write about. So again, I interviewed a ton of doctors who worked with medical intuitives. I wrote about all the research I could find, and there was a good amount of it, uh, on medical intuition, on intuition in general in healthcare. There's lots and lots of studies, but I wanted to put it in a book to say, here's what doctors say. Here's what nurses say. Here's what healthcare practitioners, how they use it. Here's what the health, mental health care field, wh what's right, what's not quite right, where can we hone this? And I found a lot of inconsistencies in the understanding of intuition. So I wrote the book to be uh, usable by both, you know, universities and lay folks who just want to know about it or want to ask their doctors if they're interested in it. And I think it achieved what I wanted it to achieve. And that is this broad view, the history and all the rest of it. And at the end of the book, uh, besides the exercises, there's a whole chapter of exercises for everyone. At the end of the book, I interviewed three leading lights in this concept of bringing medical intuition into healthcare. I mentioned Larry Dossey, the other one, uh, two others, one was uh, Lucia Thornton, who's a brilliant woman uh, that you can read about. She's just done so much in this field. But the, the, the woman that I was so proud, one of the women I was proud of interviewing was a woman named Gladys McGarry, who is not well known, but she's in the integrative and holistic field. She's called the mother of holistic medicine. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's not very well known, but she's brilliant. And uh, she was so happy to talk to me. And when she talked to me, she was just about to turn 100 years old. Okay. This is a woman oh. who's been at it for this long. And she was working with medical intuitives years and 60 years ago, you know, when people weren't even talking about it. Uh, and she was so excited and and we were, we had such a wonderful conversation. So I wanted to bring to the table the research, the efficacy, the doctors that have used it, the medical intuitives who have helped not only their patients, but also in healthcare. And I, you know, that's why it's, it is what it is. And uh, I'm very proud of it. And it, it has won some awards and we're thrilled and um, 
it's there for everyone. And and people have been reading it and I've been getting a great, great feedback just from everyday folks who are like, tell me more about this thing, right? Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much for writing this book uh, to begin with. And I highly recommend it and include the link to it in the show notes, obviously. On the other side of your work, could you please tell us a bit more about your programs and courses do you work with clients and students only in the US or anywhere in the world? How people can work with you? Yeah, just in a nutshell. Sure. Um, my pro- the, there's two programs that I offer. The first one I'm going to talk about is for everyone, and that's called Medical Intuition for Healing and Self Care. I used to teach that online or used to teach it live. Now we're creating a self study program so people can take it whenever they want, uh, and it'll be on, uh, we'll be launching it soon. People can go to the website and put themselves on the waiting list and we offer a discount for it on the waiting list, which is really nice. Okay. And uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and so what you'll learn in that program is how to create that mind-body connection for yourself so you can have a conversation with your sore knee or whatever is going on, right? And really get good information from it and people really love it. And there's some self-healing techniques in there and energy hygiene as well. Now, the main program is... Um, a level one and a level two. It is essentially a one-year program. It is open to healthcare and wellness professionals. So that means everything from health coaches and yoga teachers and whatnot to you know medical doctors and nurses and things like that, everything in between. And um, that is a comprehensive accredited, meaning we offer continuing education uh, credits, certification program in what I do in medical intuition. And our graduates that I mentioned in the study, they had just completed their one-year program and they were getting those 94 to 98% accuracy rates. So I'm very pleased to say that uh, this program is taught um, twice a year and we teach online, live online. And so you interact with your fellow classmates. We have people from all over the world. (laughs) And we're teaching people from Australia and Canada and England and everywhere else. And that's really fun. And certainly the U.S. Um, And it's available. And anyone from the healthcare fields are welcome to take this program and learn this and bring it into their practices. And that's the idea. As you learn the skill, it informs and supports your practice. Mm. When is the next intake? Uh, we teach twice a year, uh, fall and spring semesters. So September is when uh, the next one will start, and then March, the okay. next one will start. And there's the level one mm-hmm. is learning how to get the basics, really the 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 foundational tools of clairvoyant seeing, mm-hmm. of learning how to look at the biofield, looking at the chakra system, the auric field. Level two is all about the anatomy, the physiology, and the life history. There's a lot of information online on the website about it. And I'm very happy to answer questions as well if people have uh, as they go and take a look. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, Wendy, this has been a an amazing <laughs> conversation. And we could be easily talking for another several hours. So at this point, because time is catching up with us, I would like to pull everything together in a summary, high level summary, if you like, and ask you this, what is your proposed model for healthcare, which I see as a new paradigm, essentially, that modern medicine must embrace, and I'm very conscious of my language here, must embrace in order to evolve and provide comprehensive help and support for patients and comprehensive healthcare. What is your model? Well, how I frame it is if you can imagine a world where you go in to see your doctor if you're a patient or as the practitioner, you can either as a patient receive or as a doctor be able to, or or healthcare provider of some variety, any kind, can provide a complete and comprehensive view of the physical body, the emotions, the spirit, the mental issues, all in one, that's complete healthcare to me. That is personalized healthcare because it's about your energy, your physical body, your higher self information. That is uh, the vision that I hold for the future. Uh, And I want to see medical intuitives 
in every ER, in every ICU, in every clinic, available to the public, available to doctors. I want to see doctors and nurses and acupuncturists and everybody else having this training so they can offer their patients and their clients a comprehensive view of their own health from every perspective. How would that change the world? You know, it, it would be completely paradigm shifting. And we didn't talk about, you know, the stories that, you know, I've had in my career that I've written about in the book where it did shift the paradigm, right? Completely. And that's when I get very inspired by this, which it inspires me all the time. But you can see I'm a little bit on a on a soapbox with it. I wave the flag of this. I also, just to wrap up, uh, with colleagues of mine who are also medical intuitives and very aligned with this concept because we know the power of this and the efficacy of it, we created the National Organization for Medical Intuition, and that's nomimedicalintuition.org, N-O-M-I, medicalintuition.org. We encourage people to go look. We're we're creating standards of practice, we're creating codes of ethics, and we're creating the basis for a field of medical intuition that is just as effective as any other um, in terms of what it can bring to the party, right? What it can bring to healthcare. So we're excited about that. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Because this has been such an amazing conversation and, and we have covered such a big ground and, and went into all sorts of rabbit holes and, <laughs> and out on the limb. Hopefully, uh, well, not hopefully, I trust that this podcast will be helpful and useful to our audience, including medical professionals. And that will encourage people to to visit your website, to read your book, and if they feel so inspired, to sign up for your programs, because this information is absolutely deserving to be promoted and propagated as far as possible across the world at any level of healthcare, essentially. And I would say sooner rather than later. Well, I agree. So, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Wendy. It's been such a pleasure and honor to have you on Quantum living and all the best for your continuing research and, and work in this field. And I can't wait to see further developments. Thank you so much. Anna, thank you. That was so much fun. And you're such a wonderful interview and you asked so many incredible questions. Truly appreciate it. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, Please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well. <laughs>